so anyone who wants to give a lightning talk on anything or like get everyone in the room to solve their questions and problems, do that. Uh, very informal. First we have Tridge talking about stuff. <laughs> stuff. I'll have to rename the project to stuff. Um, so what do I do? If I need to be able to type at the same time, does that work? I just, yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, I'm going to give, I've never given a lightning talk before, so please excuse the inexperience. Um, so I'm going to be talking about LDB edit. Uh, given this is the database mini conf, um, I've done a little bit with databases with some lightweight database, a little one called TDB, and more recently one called LDB, um, which is LDAP on top of TDB. And these are little databases, um, but quite quick. They aim for sort of, you know, hundreds of thousands to millions of operations per second. This is not SQL. This is not any heavyweight stuff at all. But one of the cute little tools that came out of this, um, I was working with um, Active Directory, so the LDAP server built into Windows 2000 Active Directory, and we needed to be able to manipulate Active Directory and sort of edit records and that sort of thing. And I found all those GUI tools for doing it um, really painful to use. And I found using you know, LDAP search from Open LDAP and then sort of dumping out the LDIF and editing to be really painful. So I thought, what I really want to do is just sort of bring up the, um, the database in Emacs and edit away and then save, right? And so I thought, OK, well, we need to be able to do that. So we'd written this little um, LDB toolkit, which is an, we've got a new implementation of the LDAP protocol in LDB. So it's not based on Open LDAP. It's a completely new implementation of the protocol and it's client and server, and I've got this little tool, and what I can do is um, um, display name. If I do something like this and um, like that, then hopefully you will see a result, if this thing can actually resolve it. Well, it's not resolving, so ping 10.0.0.100. What is the, let's have a look at this Windows box and see what IP address it ended up with. Oh, it's still starting up its network connections. This is Windows 2003. It, as everyone knows, it's rather sluggish to get started. Uh, so we'll just wait until Windows 2003 get its act together. And once it's got its act together, then I can um, uh, start doing some tests against it. Of course, it works against a Samba server as well. If I bring up a Samba Active Directory domain controller, so I can do that, um, Samba git combine source for, you, if you went to Andrew's talk uh, on Monday, then you would have seen um, him talking about Samba 4 as an Active Directory domain controller, which has its own LDB, L LDAP server. Uh, looks like we're now up with 10, 0, 0, okay, we need to find out what the IP address is of this box. Oh, is that it? No, it's destination unreachable. Let's see, log in, and test 01, and what the hell IP address did this thing get? First rule of, do you want to reactivate Windows now? Windows was first activated in this computer, but hardware in the computer has changed significantly. Ah, oh, the <laughs> bastards! The bastards! And it's probably not on the network, and you can't bring up the network until after you activate. Do I? Well, I want to reactivate now. Okay, so if I say no, is it going to still come up? Yes, I'd like the activation to take less than five minutes. Uh, IP config. What IP? Found you hard. <laughs> oh, bloody hell. <laughs> Updates are available. Do I want to scan? Man, this, I was using this box yesterday. Oh, I've updated Ubuntu. I've updated Ubuntu, and I bet what's happened is that uh, it's seeing different virtual hardware in KVM. Um, and the different virtual hardware, Windows doesn't just use it. Do I want to connect? Because I don't have any networking, so I can't connect to Windows Update. Uh, this is a bit of a change. Install it automatically. Oh, bugger off. Okay. <laughs> what I'm going to do is I'm going to demonstrate this with a Samba server instead. And uh, rather than, so there's my Samba server, and I'll just connect to 127.0.0.1. Or I could use, you know, the local host name or whatever, and I'll need to use a, um, if I use Tridge Samba as the password, actually I might use Administrator. Um, administrator Penguin, I think. And let's see. 
Okay, there you go, it's working. Right. Um, so if I imagine you wanted to be able to edit some records on an LDAP server, right? Domain con Windows Domain Control, uh, Samba, LDAP server, Open LDAP works with any LDAP server, right? And you want to be able to edit a record. So what you do is you do LDB edit and you give it the usual Open LDAP style, L LDB, you know, Open LDAP search, LDAP search command line, and it brings up all the records. There's the LDF for all of those records. Okay, there it all is. You can just edit it to your heart's content. So I want to change something like all the country code. And so what I'm going to do is globally replace um, the country code with a different one, okay, across this entire database. Save, exit, and it's down, done six modifiers. It's now changed that country code, right? Now, you could do that with a appropriate LDAP modifier by, by constructing the LDIF yourself. But then you've got to really learn LDIF and learn the internals of LDAP to do it. Um, you could do it with sort of some scripting in, you know, PowerShell or Perl or something like that. But again, you've got to learn that. You already know your editor. And you know how to do macros in your editor. And if it's Emacs, then it can do anything. Uh, so you might as well use the power of that editor against the database. So it's a bit like VIPW, but for LDAP databases. And it's got some, some other cute things. So if I wanted to, I'll bring up those users again. And let's find a victim user that we don't like. Um, not the guest user, this DNS user, what's another one? Blue, well if I bring up just their name, so I'll say I only want to pull up the name of the users, so it makes it a little easier, that makes it a bit easier to see those records. Can you see all that there? Yeah, and let's, uh, what name shall I get rid of? Um, Tridge, he doesn't need to live there. So if I just get rid of that record, right, and get out, one delete, that record's gone, okay? Um, and that's a lot easier to do than it is to stuff around with, you know, LDB remove, etc. Um, if I want to, uh, I can create records in a similar fashion. I can um, modify any aspect of a record. Um, I can um, run it through, you know, once you're here, you can run it through said scripts, whatever you like, and modify stuff. So that's basically it. So LDB edits is just an extra little tool in your toolkit for manipulating LDAP databases, which allows you to um, do it using your favorite editor. Defaults to, you know, VI if you don't have editor set. In this case, I have dollar editor set to Emacs. And uh, something going on under here? <laughs> um, there's also a bunch of other tools that come with LDB. Um, you can, of course, back up databases. For example, if you do something like object class star, then that basically says I want the entire database, anything that has an object class, right? And if it doesn't have an object class, it's not really in LDAP. Um, so I want to put that out to foo.ldif, okay? And uh, if I use LDB search rather than LDB edit, okay? So that's created foo.ldif, um, and that's the entire database. I can now turn that into a database. If I do bin LDB add, uh, minus h um, foo.ldb, foo.ldif, then that is now created a database with the same records from that, um, that one. So you've just done a backup of Active Directory Domain Controller of all of the records uh, in it, and you can then uh, go and edit those or take an offline copy or whatever and do different things between it, which is really quite handy. Uh, you can then do searches against that database. Um, so that's it. So if you want to, if you uh, play with LDAP databases at all, I know most of you are MySQL type people and you know that sort of thing, but um, if you um, uh, happen to row the other hoe and you, you, know, you like LDAP, uh, then LDB edit might be for you. There you go. Sorry. My name's Bob Edwards. Um, I've never done a lightning talk before. I'll be doing a talk on Thursday about uh, um, pushing authentication access control into the database layer um, with PostgreSQL. Um, but 
one of the things that I'm interested also in is time variant data, how we deal with it in SQL. And so I just want to use that as an opportunity to give a quick chat about some of the thoughts I've had. Not very well thought out, but um, maybe some people can help uh, me think through it a bit. Um, so three types of data domains I'm kind of play around in. One is GIS slash mapping data. And in particular, um, I've been keeping GPS tracks for about nine years now. Um, one of the things I noticed with doing that is that roads do actually get realigned over time. Um, new highways open up and all that sort of stuff. And I'm interested in storing in the database, um, you know, what the road looked like at particular points in time or the d when the data was gathered um, and being able to do searches. If, um, if, I, if I repeated this, you know, on the 1st of July 2003, what would the road have looked like, etc. Um, and taking that data all the way back. So collecting old maps. I love collecting old maps and love um, looking at um, when the data for those maps was prepared and when the map was published, putting that information also into a database and being able to um, compare how things have changed over a period of time. Uh, another um, area of data domains I'm interested in um, more professionally uh, is dealing with student enrollment data. Um, that's kind of, it's, it's a lot more involved than just student enrollment data, but one of the things that students do is change degree programs. And when degree programs change, the rules for how they need to uh, complete their degree also change. Um, the rules don't actually change at the point at which they change their program. Um, the rules that were valid at the time they enrolled in their program continue to apply even after they change their program. And so as the programs change, we need to be able to keep track and see well, what subjects were completed at what points during the, um, the various changes to the degree program. And so again, um, we're interested not so much in what their current degree program is, but what the history is and what subjects were taken at each point and um, you know, all that sort of stuff put together there. And other things do with students like when they change their names, um, sometimes they even change their gender, all that sort of stuff. Um, we need to keep track, well actually gender doesn't matter at all, but um, sometimes it's interesting if you're talking to a lecturer and they remember a student who uh, is now a different person, so to speak. The third, uh, the third area which I also like, um, this, I guess it's more of a hobby than professional, is with um, artificial intelligence and processing data from vision systems. Uh, an example here that uh, I, I often sort of think about and do some work on is a c camera system that's looking at a room, like the, uh, the room outside my office, uh, and it observes various things inside that room that are fixed over periods of time, like the walls and the shelves and things like that, and then things that are moving, like people walking in or out. There's also some things like doors that open and close, and so the doors move in repeatable ways, but not necessarily um, in a periodic way. Um, but being able to identify that the door, um, th this um, solid panel sort of swings out and then swings back again um, and being able to represent that sort of information in a database so that uh, later on when um, you're trying to, for example, program a robot to negotiate around the room, it can identify there's a door there and whether the door's opened or closed. <coughs> so those sort of things that I'm interested in doing with, um, with data where the data changes, um, Traditionally, when data changes, you throw out the old data and just put the new data in. You might keep a log of what the old data had, and you might keep a log of who changed it and why they changed it. What I like to do is keep the old data in the table and to flag um, when it changed, um, when the, the period of time that the data was valid. <coughs> Some data changes over relatively short periods of time, so doors opening and closing. Other data changes over very long periods of time, like um, roads being realigned. Um, or people changing their degree programs. And some, some of the data changes periodically. I'd like to be able to identify that, but that's kind of outside the scope of the database. That's kind of more applying artificial you know, um, you know, filtering type technologies to the data. But you might want to represent the database that um, the data is actually changing in a repeatable, some kind of repeatable way, like a door opening and closing. So you don't continuously log lots of data. Um, Mainly interested in working with PostgreSQL, um, PostGIS extensions in particular for the mapping and the um, vision type stuff. Um, one of the things I like to be able to do is perform joins and subselects on the database at a particular point in time. So say um, at this particular time, 
uh, not so much a timestamp of the state of the database at a particular point in time, which is to do with backups and um, auditing and that sort of stuff, but to do with the um, values of the data at a particular point in time, which might actually be put in quite a lot later. Um, so the way we do it, the way I'm doing it at the moment, of course, is adding extra columns, which um, s have a valid start and valid end times in them, timestamps, and lots of where clauses that keep comparing all these things. One of the things I'm looking at doing, um, hopefully, is to add an extension to uh, to PostgreSQL <coughs> that. Uh, puts in some hidden columns that allow this information to, um, to exist along with the normal data in each table and then when um, selects and joins or joins and subselects are done uh, it will automatically um, include the times the time periods in um, pulling out the valid rows. So there's still a lot of work to be done. If anyone has any other ideas on ways to do this sorts of stuff I'll be quite interested to talk to you about it. So if the data is, if there's quite a lot of changes to a particular, particular piece of data, yeah. Yeah. But database is good at handling data, right? That's what they're there for. So, um, you know, I keep wondering, am I overloading the database? Well, it's its job to do the data, so. Um, yeah. That's right. Anyway, thanks. I think Rusty's talk's just about to start. Okay. I might um, compile. Uh, <laughs> no, we compile all the time. Uh, so the current way to run Drizzle is to pull the source tree and compile it. Uh, so you can do this pretty easily because it's up on Launchpad. So you can use, uh, first you'll need Bazaar, uh, revision control system. Use recent Bazaar, don't use the old ones. Uh, so anything beyond about 1.7 is usually quickest. Um, but that's fairly painless to install on every operating system that we've used. Yep. Uh, it will suck down, I clocked it in, we're about 39 megabytes now. Yeah, but that memory is in the Is that smart? <laughs> Does that do it quit smart from the shared repository? Yeah. Why aren't you using shared repository? No, I am, but okay. I, yeah, I didn't. Oh, it's already a one, yep. Yeah, we see that a lot. We don't know. Yep. This ah. is done now. Yeah. Cool. So we branched. We currently have a bunch of revisions uh, in there. Uh, so we've branched a repository called Drizzle tra Test. Uh, we are completely using AutoConf, AutoMake, and other such uh, pane for doing it. So first you want to generate that uh, because we're not doing tables. When we start doing tables around, right. yeah, we give you no configure file. You have to make it. So you get to generate that, which, yeah, we'll just generate it before doing tables. Oh, no, yeah, we generate the, the tarballs will come from make this check. They, they will go into the, Configure goes into the tarball. You, that's the whole point of autocon. And then, but the, con the configure ship will never get checked into version control. That, that's a bad idea. So if you're running on a Spark box that's got many threads, this is the slowest step, yeah. uh, except for configure. Oh, no, you always ship the configure file to users. That's the design of configure. Oh, oh, sorry, all right, sorry. I parsed your sentence in, in reverse in my head. <laughs> Monty sometimes works on reverse Polish notation. Uh. <laughs> That's an interesting idea, putting that in a, in a, in a branch with a generated configure. Yeah, we should do that. Good point. 
So, <laughs> uh, so our configure script will pick up uh, everything you need and will error out. A few notable libraries you will require is Google Protobufs. Uh, you will need 202. Yes. Uh, yep, you will need PCRE. Libevent. Libevent. Readline. Yep. Uh, uh, libz, which is probably running system anyway. Uh, you don't need curses. Unless I think we optionally build with libz. Um, so only if you're on, on some versions of Mac OS X do you need the uh, in curses. Um, <laughs> And uh, libuuid if you're a system that needs a separate libuuid. Yeah. Uh, and I'll give you a bit of a printout at the end what you're doing. We'll try and find the right compilers and stuff in there. We currently compile with GCC 4 and above. 412 and stuff is kind of like, yeah, it mostly works. I was fixing a few things today. We all run like 4.3, I guess. So no one's running 4.4 yet, I don't think. Uh, we compile with uh, compiler warnings equals errors. Uh, so it is quite possible that we just enabled overzealous errors for your GCC version, and that could error out instead. Uh, but if you're running like Ubuntu releases, it shouldn't be a problem. Yeah, translate our error messages. We have fully translatable messages for the server. There's work logs for it now. I saw the mails go through and it's like, ha ha, we have it. Um, <laughs> we will also, if you have uh, TC malloc installed, uh, which is a Google replacement malloc library that's a lot nicer for threading, uh, we will automatically use that if you have it. If not, it's just libc malloc. Uh, and uh, at least on MySQL, it can give up to like a 50% speed boost for some workloads for using TC malloc. We haven't benched it in Drizzle yet. We have a bunch of things that have changed from MySQL that could make that different. Otherwise, on Solaris, we will build with empty malloc, and we will build with Sun Studio compilers if you're running, I guess it's just Solaris that has that, yeah. uh, as, <laughs> as Spark or x86. Yeah. Um, although it's, it's autoconf, so if you have both Sun Studio and GCC installed, um, it will prefer GCC unless you set CC and CXX to CC and CC, respectively, the capital CC for CXX. But, um, because it thinks that GCC is the, so if you want to build with Sun Studio and you also have also installed GCC, you have to tell configure to do so. Um, which you should, because um, the Solaris is, there's no good way to install, in, unless you build it from source, uh, to install a GCC newer than 3.4 on Solaris at the moment. <laughs> and we don't we, we periodically it. poke people in the ribs, yeah. uh, <laughs> which is good we fun. Don't, we don't compile with Pretty much. Actually, one yeah. Fix your operating system uh, is, is part of the thing. So that means uh, so that we can no Ultrix, uh, no, no AIX, no HPUX. Um, I don't think uh, Jonas has bought the banhpux.org domain yet. I keep threatening to do it. Oh, Eric's is, is dead anyway, so. You can't buy Eric's from SGI and you can't even get the. <laughs> <laughs> Periodically, it's like, damn it, this thing would just work on Irix. <laughs> and so we've got uh, building, depending on the speed of your machine. Uh, Uh, if you see some errors in here, odds are we have a bug in our auto tools, uh, or you're on OS 10 and there's some read line failure. Yeah, although we Cause it, yes. Ah, yes. If you look at look in our compile options, we have what is it? W all, W extra, W error, W pedantic, undef, no redundant decals, no long long, uh, no strict aliasing. No exception. Uh, 
strict aliasing, there's a section of code where the strict aliasing warning is, uh, it's because we need to fundamentally fix a, a large chunk of code, and we just haven't gotten around to fundamentally fixing that yet, because it's, what's that? Yeah. Yep. You cannot check in, well you can't, you can check it in, but yeah, we won't merge it because it won't compile if you have a compiler warning in there. Uh, which we found, uh, how many bugs did we fix with that? Like 400. No. Uh, we also had the great fun of new glibc, like round, was it 2.7, 2.8? Whatever ships in Ubuntu 8.10 and wasn't in 8.4, uh, has annotations inside libc for like checking the return value of like read and write system calls. Uh, so this becomes warning in our code. So when that was first released, I upgraded my laptop and then spent four hours fixing the compile of all these non-checked <laughs> IO errors inside the server. Uh, so we check all that kind of things for like IRS, which is really nice. Uh, we'll probably start doing that a lot more inside our code as well. Uh, so really it's, it's to do best development is running modern libc, uh, modern uh, it's sort of funny cause I, I compilers looked, as well. I looked at using uh, GNU lib, um, to, GNU lib allows you to, to copy in chunks of code um, from, the, from the sort of the GNU lib repository to replace uh, things that aren't, well maybe some things that are maybe broken on a system or like so it makes like a, 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 a you know convenience lib that may or may not have things in it to replace things in your uh, on your system if you're if you're broken. And the one of the main reasons that we wound up not doing that um, is that uh, some of that code does not uh, compile cleanly with weren't all the warnings turned on, and they won't accept the patches to fix it. I, I like specifically rejected this. We don't we don't care about the we don't care about building warning clean. We're not going to accept that patch if that's all it's doing. And so it's like, well, we can't use your well, software. Well, and all of them, I mean, if you look at the code, it's clean. You know, here's, you know, so that pissed me off. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, because it turns on W <laughs> error and the, and the test programs that it's using don't pass. W error, yeah. So we set W error in our C flag after we've done all of the uh, all the the testing of things. In your environment, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And and one of the, one of the great things about that is that it um. Uh, one of the other things that I love, and we've also got to work around to, to fix this in our configure script, is the fact that it assumes that it's a great idea to inject um, uh, dash g dash o2 uh, into your C flags if you're building with GCC. Uh, I, I don't want dash o2 in my C flags, I want something else. So please don't add that to my C flags, please. And it would be really great if there was an option for that, but what you can do is you can, uh, you can trick it by setting your C flags to something before you call AC canonical target. But um, it's th that that I think is really, and it doesn't do that for any other compiler, just GCC, and it always adds them. There's no combination of flags that you can pass it that it doesn't add them unless you've set T flag to something else. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Oh, I, I'm by no means saying that auto tools are perfect. They're just. The problem is, that anyone comes up with a replacement, it seems to never be used. Yeah. Kind of thing. Because, because the thing is, is that as, as, as many problems as there are in autoconf and automake, they were, they grew as many things did in, in, the, in the sort of current set of standard Linux stuff, they grew organically out of the problems that we had before, you know, and so, gosh, if anybody, you know, if anybody wants to complain about automake and then go remember what iMake was like, you know, I mean, dear God. <laughs> Yeah, but that was, that was, you know. Uh, I don't I, let subversion code on my computer. Yeah, yeah. Like, 
I don't, don't use want it subversion. anywhere near. <laughs> yeah, if I if I need to check something out from Subversion, I use Bazaar. So I use Bazaar or Git to, as a as, as um, Subversion clients. Yeah. So I, I've actually found out everything I've ever tried to pull out, this was before the BZRSVN one had viable IDs to really do back and forth. I found out no matter what repository it was, I could store the entire repository history in Git using Git SVN in less disk space than a single checkout of using the subversion client. All the time. <laughs> like including like whole books and graphics and everything. It's like Git can store like, you know, the past 4,000 revisions to everything, whatever, in less disk space. Usually, sometimes I had to leave it, you know, overnight to pull the repository, but. Without hitting the server, yeah. So you've got to keep. Yeah. Mm. So this is the downside of Drizzle Dev of waiting for it to build. Yeah. So so the interesting. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're now not running with CCache. <laughs> yeah, so, so so it's it's interesting because when we first started this, when we first worked it from MySQL, our our build was faster. Um, it has so, but the the thing is, is that we have uh, uh, in in addition to C plus plus sizing more of more of the source code, uh, we we're also building at a higher optimization level. So we're 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 building with with C plus plus and O three on everything, and so it just takes longer for the C compiler to do its work. I don't run with O3 because I actually want symbols in my debugger <laughs> and symbols in my Valgrind But runs. so in, in, in this, in this, you know. <laughs> it's actually, so, so actually part of it. Mostly blank. <laughs> so the, actually the reason that I've got O3 on is, is actually more for, uh, because it turns on a different set of, of, uh, of warnings and errors rather than actually, I don't care about the, the, the optimization itself but because it's turning on the optimization, it, go, it does some different passes through the code, and you get different analysis of your of your code. And that's that's actually the reason I want the O3 on, is it triggers it triggers different compile errors. Yes, yes, I completely agree because I wouldn't, I don't think that the optimization is giving me a, a performance difference at all. Um, it's more for the more strictness. Mm. Um, possibly, yeah. And some abortive kind of. Yeah, I don't know that we're any method. any longer. I just know that our compile time has increased over time as we've ratcheted up, as as we as we've ratcheted up the the compiler catching more more throwing more errors for us. So, we but that's I think I'm happy with that. Like I'm okay with that. We removed you know? the manual archive manipulation mode. What's that? Yeah. 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 Um, right. Uh, no, because yet. they're broken. So um, <laughs> there's there's, <laughs> there's a couple the couple problems that I've, I've run into. I've got I've got some code actually in the in the make files to to turn them on. Like I could do a dash dash with precompiled headers and and it. it uh, maybe not. So that's so. There's a couple things in there. If there's an automake uh, thing, I could do that, but then I'd require everybody to update, upgrade their automake to the patched version because we're right. So far, I've been trying to require automake 110, and I've been getting shot down. I'm still having to re to, to to support fucking 19. Is um, that OS 10's fault? Yes. Yeah. Um, and no, it's actually also Rel's fault. Um, right. Yeah. So. So so far, I haven't been able to convince anybody to. to, to so anyway, so the thing the thing that, that breaks it's actually not just automate. Uh, GCC also, if I tell it to to to, to GCC a, a header, 
and, and precompile it, it um, and, and something fails with it and it errors, it still creates the header. It creates an empty header file. Yes. Um, and so, so that breaks all the dependency stuff. The other problem is that I've got a problem with the the dual. Uh, so we're we're doing the the dual. Uh, the pool does the dual, dual static dynamic. What's that? Yes, it leaves the empty file. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, it, it's just, yeah. <laughs> So the other problem is that I haven't tracked down the, like I, uh, so in some circumstances, and I haven't been able to isolate exactly what, what's causing this, but it's, it, it winds up sucking in either the wrong precompiled header or it, 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 something happens and my GCC build seg faults. Um, and so at that point I'm like, I'll come back to it later. <laughs> so, but that's, that's actually the, the reason, other, uh, other than speeding up build times, one of the reasons I wanted to do that is I wanted to get all of the headers to be um, pre-compile clean so that I could go through and, and, and compile each of them so that I knew that their, that their dependencies were appropriate and that they included the things they needed to include and include guards were set and all of the various things like that as another, as another sort of static code check. We had some... Yeah, yeah. we've had a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not expecting to entirely win, but... Um, but the, I want to fix the everything includes everything else problem, but I also want to fix the this header assumes that you've, in, you've included this other header first, but it uses things that it needs from that other header. Yeah. Include so the damn things there's that you need. Oh, sweet. I'd like to, I'd like to see that. Okay. <coughs> what? Yeah, he was... So, so it, it's it's that trade off because right now, so there's a couple things where I want to I want to unroll some stuff all the way to the point where it's correct, and then go back through and and then and then sort of re-roll some things up so that there's some optimizations for build time and stuff like that. So we've got documented what what's actually going on. But right now everything's so spiderweb that I think that I think that worrying that I'm adding an extra 30 seconds onto the build is the wrong concern at the moment. I want to make sure that the code's doing the right thing. Um, and that everything is, is happy. So. Oh. Yeah, it's on battery. Dude, C cache. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but anyway, it's compiling and it'll keep compiling. You've seen compiling happen before. No? <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, the problem with this, the problem with this is that I, I, I get addicted We should also mention we have make test. Oh, make test actually works. And we have tests that now take forever to execute. Um, but that's because we fixed all the tests. Yeah. Uh, if you want to make it faster, LD preload lib eat my data. Um, just a little shared lib that disables fsync and so makes your transactional storage engines incredibly quick and not crash safe. Uh, and that's really good when you're running the test suite, especially when you're doing it all the time on. <laughs> yeah. 
So I've been I've been starting to write a bunch of like little LD preload libs to do various things like uh, you know return uh, 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 e inter or something from close 50 times and then do it successfully and stuff like that. And usually I find that everything is so broken that like the Perl script that runs the tests like Perl dies first or then you, you get to and you can't actually start up the server and you go, yeah, shit, I've got other things to do. So I, what it, a lib malloc fail is another one I did of like fail calls to malloc uh, randomly at a certain time. And it's like the problem was it actually was seg faulty in like, uh, like CRT zero or whatever it is now, like before you actually call main. Um, <laughs> Uh, Rusty's way I did with NetFilter was the test suite there. Uh, when you get to a malloc, it forks. One succeeds, one fails. Um, which is great when all your state's in memory. The only thing is for us, I'd have to duplicate the on-disk st uh, state and fudge that somehow. Yeah, it's like He's some kind of snapshot in there. It's like, oh my god, we have a use for ZFS. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but wait, it means I have to use Solaris. Uh, ButterFS. I'm <laughs> and, and we'll do it from that. ButterFS, BetterFS. Um, la last time Zach was like, mmm, butter. Uh, <laughs> what was the whole idea? Um, or B tree, or yeah. So it's it's in tree. Uh, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> um, I'm on battery. We get to talk about Drizzle in the meantime. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I think I think it's actually more my my disk um, than than the low power part of it. Sixty four. So it's even also better. Also, same thing. We've been doing uh, Indian uh, Power PC and Smart builds for similar reasons. Yeah. So I started up my PPC build host, uh, which is the slowest machine ever, uh, with no memory, uh, literally no memory. Uh, my clock applet uses about as much memory as it has. Uh, <laughs> I was thinking of that the other day. <laughs> I was thinking. So Waffle Grids, the guys uh, did the InnoDB buffer cache, and like when something's going to be thrown out of it, instead it stores it in memcached. Uh, and so you pull for it, you basically expand your machine's memory by adding memcached servers, and it still writes the disk safely and everything. It just uses for like the cache properly there. Um, and it's like, hmm, I could use that for swap, uh, and do it that way, which could kind of help because like, actually, it would probably be faster. Uh, so. My machine in the garage, the T1000, the 16 gig of memory, which is the most memory I've got in the box, is in the garage because it's too fucking loud to have in the house. Like anywhere in the house. I tried it in the laundry and everything, it's just too loud. So don't buy one to use at home. Pardon? <laughs> I didn't try it as a clothes dryer. It's like realizing it's like, yeah, I bought an expensive stereo to hear the music, not to hear like some giant fans. I'm looking at it going, replace it with resistors. So it's propped up in my garage and connected via wireless because. Didn't have a piece of Ethernet cable long enough to run to the garage yet. <laughs> However many is in the fifty-four twenty thing. One hundred and twenty-eight hardware threads, whatever. Sysbench at the moment actually uh, running it against Drizzle. Uh, Sysbench itself, I think, is, is running into a, uh, some sort of threading issue. It's not, and it may be in my Drizzle driver for it, but it, um, it's bombing out a lot of the stuff. So I'm not sure, sure about whether it's Drizzle or whether it's Sysbench or whether it's. Yeah. 
Yeah, that happens quite often. Yeah. Uh, we've actually got also in our in our thing here, uh, make test is hooked into make check. Um, so when you run make disk check, um, it won't make you a tarball until not only is it's built in a vpath, but also until make test is also passed. Um, so make disk check is actually like fully useful um, for for us um, and stuff. Gotta pass the test to you or you get no tarball. No. Uh, Jay is theoretically writing a new um, a new test system for us. Yeah. yeah. Oh right, yeah, 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 yeah that's right. Uh, yeah. Well, one of his benefits I hope is to run it in parallel. So there's uh, the MySchool test run uh, thing that we use a derivative of uh, there is now a, a parallel version of it which spawns, you know. Uh, you specify a configuration parameter of number of CPUs, and it spawns like at least that many, or double that many, or something like. So it spawns that many uh, instances of the database server and runs the tests on different ones of them. Uh, Jay's one will run it uh, each individual test in a separate database in the same database server, so that if running multiple things at once, it could blow up. Yeah, <laughs> beer will fix it. Beer will fix it. More. Uh, oh, the <laughs> there's a dirty little secret. Oh, right. Yeah, there's a lot of disabled tests. <laughs> if it doesn't work, you can disable it. <laughs> Not most of them. There's a lot of them that aren't disabled, but there's a lot of them that are disabled. What? One of the big things is all our test suite runs against InnoDB. Uh, our default engine is InnoDB, so all our tests work now with InnoDB. There are, yeah, maybe a dozen tests that like do explicit engines MyISM for like some specific MyISM testing or some stuff to get um, really make sure the statistics like on indexes and stuff and everything is accurate and the same. Uh, they keep running the same server, uh, so we actually like test InnoDB more. Uh, crash testing stuff could be interesting to actually get going, especially with um, uh, Phillips random query generator now that we have the Perl module for Drizzle, uh, the Drizzle, so we could use that and try and get some random queries splatting against the server. Otherwise known as crash it in new and interesting ways, apart yeah. from the 15 ways that I have no test for, but I know I can. <laughs> oh, you're running Bazaar in the background as well. I am. But I'm 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 pushing uh, something to Launchpad so that um, I can, um, yeah. Although of course it's going to work this time in exactly the same way that you told me that it was going to work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That right there is, uh, it's a branch of MySQL. Yeah. So that's the, so the thing is they have a bizarre branch that has some patches in it. And so then this thing that, so I'm, I'm wanting to push up into their thing uh, branches of MySQL with the patches applied because, right, because that's the sensible thing. And um, uh, do you have um, lib eat my data? What's that? Do you have lib eat my data? Yeah. Well, we should also get live eat my data. Where did I put it? Aha. So I should like create a project and stuff for live eat my data. Random shit. Originally, <laughs> originally it was like one source file. It said like four revisions or something in there. 
the skin. Six, sorry, and one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I even have make test. As in it actually runs it and we'll see if like LD preload works. So like on OS 10 or something that will fail. Win. So now, LD preload. Uh, there's a different way to do it. Uh, uh, you can actually. Trudge has done it and showed me, so really it's my own fault for not having ported it to OS 10 yet, but then I don't have an OS 10 box, so I don't care. <laughs> uh, make test, libby, so libber my data disables uh, the osync flag on open, uh, fsync, fdata sync. The fdata sync was a patch from someone else. It's like, well, none of my software uses it. Uh, <laughs> literally, the first one was like, well, this works for me. <laughs> Like it even did open wrong, but it worked for the call that I used. Um, there are some instances in some compiler levels that doesn't actually go through libc for your open syscall and goes directly doing a syscall thing that is harder to wrap. Depends on your file system. ext3 doesn't use write barriers by default. Um, Yeah, people started using live eat my data for fi running under Firefox to like have it working. I'm like, well, here's a good use. Um, <laughs> hey, cleft, does, did, did someone fix the cleft test? What? Awesome, someone fixed the travel cleft test. So for a comparison here, uh, what can we do? This is how much fast, doesn't that work for dragging it out? No. 12 is the new 16. Uh, so here is a comparison on how long it takes, and this proves to everyone they should run leave, leave eat my data all the time. So let's look at here. The really small tests are really hard to see which one runs the thing. Ah, that does it. Um, if you line up to about the 5900 to that one, I think the 61. So things tend to execute quicker with libby my data rather than not. I did go through all the tests and like batch everything into transactions as, as much as possible. Like all these tests did like a loop, like four 1,000 rows, insert, insert, insert with auto commit on. <laughs> That was the, uh, we were hacking at Brian's place, I'm like, here, accept this, improves the test speed by 1,800%. He's like, let me think how many times I run this, you just saved me an hour a day. <laughs> Make test should pass, if it doesn't pass, you either have buggy compiler or buggy operating system or something new. Make install kind of works. Sometimes people file bugs with like make install. It should work when it's running. Yep. Although I've done none, no work on it. Mm. Like, I mean, it's got, it's, it's the same reason, like, like some of the mentioned earlier uh, patching Drupal for Ubuntu or whatever, and we were specifically not doing that. Just like, as soon as we start patching it, other people start to call and make it patch. And it's not time to do Right. And that's, it's not, it's not time. As soon as, as soon as we release Tarball, We have cool tests, let's see. So, this is a bug in Ubuntu. Create, it's, oh. Yeah, 
no, Clef doesn't. This only you can only see the character on OS 10 because it's above two to the 16. Somewhere inside like font config or something is something that doesn't work properly. But we have Snowman. For those of you who cannot see so small, yeah, it's below two to the 16. Create database snowman. Oh, the minus sign isn't there on QWERTY. Uh oh. I don't know what your computer is doing. Yes. We we try we we so so we're being smart. It's like, you know what? It's like Unicode, right? So we can store Unicode file names. We'll just name it snowman.test. Uh, and it's like, we keep on going, say, isn't this cool? Aren't we like smart ass? And it's like, we'll see which, which, what thing breaks. And then Lee comes on. So he's like our manager who goes on. I can no longer check out the source tree. It gives this like <laughs> back thing. It's like, oh, you're running on Solaris, aren't you? Um, which was the other realization. So something along the stack in Solaris like breaks with Python and UTF-8 and file names. Yeah, with bizarre. <laughs> but yeah, Snowman works. Uh, Clef seems to work in backticks now, but not if it's alone for some reason. So that's a bug somewhere, because Snowman works. Uh, it's a, like a base Clef thing. Uh, which if you have OS 10 here, you will see like musical notes, and this is above like two to the 16, and this exposes everything because it's kind of broken. Smaller? Uh, mm, keyboard. What is it, control minus? Oh, it's control shift minus for me. I've mapped it to something else. Wait, now why is my font so? <laughs> Close the terminal. <laughs> I'll make sure it's not going to propagate. Okay. Because <laughs> let me tell you what I don't want to do, and that's propagate that. <laughs> so this used to be really fast because we had none of the test work, but now it's longer. Um, so the process has gotten long again because we fixed all the tests and so they enabled all, all the warnings and did everything else. Oh, that ODBC test is so bullshit. Yeah, it doesn't work properly. <laughs> cool. Once you have this, you can actually use Drizzle. Uh, LibDrizzle is still in a separate repository. It will always be. Will always be. Yeah. Uh, and we have some stuff in there now. So at some point, you will require another dependency called LibDrizzle, uh, LT colon LibDrizzle. Uh, which is the client library. So this book being the reason this new guy doesn't enable the package that I don't want to Entirely new library. And difficult, not difficult, different protocol. <laughs> <laughs> How do we have a time zone test? We don't have time zones. So we haven't ripped them out yet. Uh, JSA hasn't been pushed yet. I thought we didn't have any Python things. That's another thing. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, maybe it's just an empty test that doesn't do anything. We, 
switch async thing. Starting up multiple queries? Employees? No idea. 